together and sing praise to the Lord this morning. Number 538 in your songbooks, blessed be the name of the Lord. Sing praise to the Lord on that first verse. Sing it out, church. Ready? All praise to him who reigns above in majesty supreme, who gave his son for man to die, that he might man redeem. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Great singing, church. Keep it up on the second verse. His name above all names shall stand, exalted more and more. At God the Father's own right hand, where angel hosts adore. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Redeemer, Savior, friend of man, once ruined by the fall, thou hast devised salvation's plan. For thou hast died for all. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Great singing on the last verse. His name shall be the Counselor. The mighty Prince of Peace, of all earth's kingdoms conqueror, whose reign shall never cease. Sing it, church. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Let me ask you, wherever you're at in your life right now, can you honestly and sincerely sing those words to the Lord? Blessed be the name of the Lord. You remember, as far as I know, the first person recorded in the Bible to say those words was Job. And he said them when he was at the absolute bottom in his life the Lord giveth the Lord hath taken away blessed be the name of the Lord if you're having a good day today you're having a good week you're in a good season of your life I'm happy for you and I hope you have the integrity at such a time to say blessed be the name of the Lord but I hope if you're going through a very rough stretch where you just say, man, I, I, I don't, I don't, man, I just don't know what's going on. I can't figure this out. Has the Lord left me? Is the Lord, as we talked about in our adult Bible class, is the Lord still taking me somewhere? I used to think he was. Right now it's feeling, feeling kind of lonely as far as the Lord goes. Are you able there? to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Do you know that was the great burden of Job's trials? He couldn't find God. Yeah, he lost his business, he lost his wealth, he lost his, his children, he lost his health, he lost the support of his wife, he lost the support of his closest friends. He was totally isolated. But the biggest problem was, I can't find the Lord. I can't find the Lord in all this. And God eventually showed up and not only gave him back twice of everything that he had had before, but his presence was real to Job again. 
But at the lowest, in the darkest hour, Job said, the Lord giveth. The Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Are you able, no matter where you are in your life, to say, blessed be the name of the Lord? I don't mean to start preaching, but I brought this up in, in our adult Bible class, and it's in the message today as well because it's heavy on my heart. That we are on the verge, I think, of suffering in our country like we've never known. I really believe that. And I know I've been talking about that for about 15 years, but you have to admit it has gotten exceedingly worse, not one bit better than it was 15 years ago when I started talking about it. And I'm certainly not the only preacher that's been saying this. But we are headed for extreme suffering in our country. If you can't say, blessed be the name of the Lord when your cabinets are full, what are you going to say when all you got left is what you have stored up? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's sing that chorus again. Just sing it unto the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Amen. Sing unto the Lord. Sing it again. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Amen. You had seasons where, man, you had friends all around you and you, they, you loved them and you knew that they loved you. And now you're in a season where you're feeling very lonely. But blessed be the name of the Lord because your sins are still forgiven. You still have the Lord Jesus Christ. You still have the eternal words of God. You still have an audience with God in prayer. You still have the spirit of God living in, within you. And you still have God's promise of eternal life. Blessed be the name of the Lord. There was a time when all your bills were paid and you had money to do extra things, and now you say, man, things are getting tighter and tighter and tighter, and I don't know what happened. I really didn't change anything. But you're still on your way to heaven. You still have eternal life. You will still not spend one single second in a place of damnation called hell. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So, man, I'm discouraged, and I don't know why. I've, I'm just, I've, I've been in a period of, of uh, man, borderline depression, and I don't know why. I can't seem to motivate myself. I can't seem to, I don't have the drive I used to have, and I don't know why. But you still have the Spirit of God living inside of you. You still have God's promises. You still have his promises. The joy of the Lord is my strength. You still have those words, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Hey, maybe you're in a period of spiritual weakness. Like, man, you've never struggled with temptation. You've never struggled with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the, I mean, not to the extreme that you are now. I mean, where did this come from? All of a sudden, I just, I can't say no to temptation. All of a sudden, I, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not living victoriously. What's going on? Is God mad at me? Has he given up on me? No, you're his child. He's your father. He hasn't given up on you. But can you say, blessed be the name of the Lord? Even as you confess your sin and repent and ask the Lord to strengthen you. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Wherever you're at today. That's a wonderful thing about praising the Lord. You are never in a place in your life where it is out of line for you to give glory to God. It's always appropriate. 
it's always a bullseye. Let's sing one more time. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us together today. Thank you, Lord, for all that you have done in this place. Thank you, Lord, for meeting with us again and again in this room. Thank you, Lord, for the believers, people who have gotten saved right here, people who have grown in their grace right here, grown in grace and your grace right here that are now around the world loving you, serving you. We praise you for that. We praise you for using this congregation right here. We thank you for it. I pray, Father, today that you'd bless the junior church downstairs. Bless Brother Jose. Bless the boys and girls. I pray that you would uh, bless the service here. Father, I pray for our loved ones at New Heights Baptist Church. I pray that you'd bless their service today powerfully. Meet with them in power. Continue to bless them and use them for thy glory. I pray. Lord, I pray for each person in the room this morning who's carrying a heavy burden. Give them grace. Give them strength. Give them hope. Give them hope. Strengthen their faith. Put our eyes upon Jesus this morning, I pray. And Lord, we give you permission at the outset of the service to take over the service. We've got plans. We've got things that we've prepared. We've spent hours and hours preparing things for the next hour. But you can change them, Lord. Take it anywhere you want to. And help us to follow your lead. Show us the way, we pray. Meet with us in power. Have your way among us, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. Be seated, please. Let's hear from our choir.
Let's stand together again and keep praising the Lord this morning. Song number 177 in your hymn book, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Let's think about the words on the first verse this morning. Sing praise to the Lord on the first verse. Ready? Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Sing, church. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Great sing and keep it up on the last verse. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth. Own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Great singing. Let's sing one more song of praise this morning. He will hold me fast. Let's think about the words on the first verse. When I fear, my faith will fail. Christ will hold me fast. He's got us. Isn't that awesome? Let's think about the words on the first verse. When I fear, my faith will fail. Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, He will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold. Through life's fearful path, for my love is often cold, he must hold me fast. He will hold me fast, he will hold me fast, for my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. Think about the words, church. Those he saves are his delight. Christ will hold me fast. Precious in his holy sight. He will hold me fast. He'll not let my soul be lost. His promises shall last, but by Him at such a cost, He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast, for my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. Sing praise on the last verse. For my life he bled and died. Christ will hold me fast. Justice has been satisfied. Praise the Lord. He will hold me fast. Raised with him to endless life. 
He will hold me fast Till our faith is turned to sight When He comes at last Praise the Lord He will hold me fast He will hold me fast For my Savior loves me so he will hold me fast. Let's sing that chorus one more time, a cappella. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. Great singing, church. You may be seated. Let's go to the Lord in prayer on behalf of our country, and um, let's ask God to do what only he can do. Let's ask God to do what no protest can do. Let's ask God to do what no political party can do. Let's ask God to do what no politician can do. Let's ask God to do what only he can do. to send a spirit in our country of repentance. Christians realizing how cold their hearts are. Churches realizing how void of the Holy Ghost they are. Churches realizing how hungry the world around them is for the gospel and turning our hearts to the Lord. And as Leonard Ravenhill, who was a, a uh, tremendous voice of revival, Pentecostal evangelist, tremendous voice of revival in the 20th century, and his quote is there, if the church gets God, America will soon feel it. We're praying for our country, but ultimately, in my opinion, we're praying for the American church to not just go through the motions, to not count on what the Lord has used us to do in the past. I, I praise the Lord, and on my knees last night in men's prayer meeting, I just reviewed before the Lord some of the things that he has used us to do in the past. And quite frankly, it's more than what most churches get to do, especially churches our size. Our size, according to statistics, is the size of the average church in America. We're not a tiny church. We're not a huge church. The average church averages about 80 people. Most churches our size don't get to do the things that we've gotten to done, praise the Lord, for what he has done. But we can never be content that we've done enough. Just sometime get in your car and drive through our city and see the people and ask yourself, do they know the Lord? Have they ever, ever even heard the gospel? We're not looking for some magnificent crowd. We're just looking to find the next person that needs to, that's ready to hear about Jesus that will receive the message. And we need to have the burden to take the message to them and the character to take the message to them. But I'm saying the American church needs to be revived to our apathy, to our coldness or at best lukewarmness. Most churches in America of, of any stripe, Bible-believing churches, are not running at that red-hot place of Holy Ghost fire. And we ought to hunger and thirst for that. And we ought to turn our hearts to the Lord. So we're going to pray for America and more specifically the American church. Can God do it? Absolutely. He's done it before. Will God do it? I think I really think that's up to us. And if God says, nope, too late, won't do it, then I at least want him to hear us pleading. I don't know the mind of God totally, that's for sure. But I know he wants us to be hungry enough to plead for him to work. So let's go to the Lord. You pray where you are. I'll pray where I am. And in a moment, I'll close this in prayer to pray 
for America and specifically American churches for the Lord to bring a spirit of repentance and revival to Christians in America. Let's pray. Father, you've done it before. You've done it before in America. You've done it before throughout church history and world history. And not because we were good or people were good, but because they were desperate and they called out to you in prayer. We may not be there yet, Lord. We may not be desperate enough yet. We may still be too comfortable to truly call out to you in prayer. And I don't know if I'm praying this on behalf of everybody here, but I'm certainly praying on my own behalf. If we're not there where we're desperate enough to call out to you for help, bring me there. Bring me there, Lord, where I cry and plead before you for you to send an awakening to our country that will cause believers to be right with you so we're ready to face you and would cause the lost to be saved. And God, I pray that you'd do a mighty work in this room this morning. I pray that you'd work among us powerfully. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Good morning. Turn me, if you will, to the book of Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy. I'm going to be reading Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 20 through 25. If you're glad that you're saved today, shout amen. amen. Glad you have a Bible today, shout amen. 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 All right, let's stand together and for the reading of God's word. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 20 to 25. And when thy son asked thee in time to come, saying, what mean the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments which the Lord our God hath commanded you? Then thou shalt say unto thy son, We were Pharaoh's bondmen in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders, great and sore upon Egypt, upon Pharaoh, and upon all his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from thence, that he might bring us in to give us the land which he sware unto our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God, for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God, as he hath commanded us. We'll pray. We'll have a special and continue with the service. Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you, Lord, that your commandments, 
your statutes are eternal. And nothing that this world tries to do can ever, ever, ever defeat them. Lord, in our days where we seem so lost, help us to remember these things. Help us to be in your word. Help us just to continue to remember these things, especially in this day and age where the world wants us to forget. Father, we do pray for that spirit of revival within our church, within our country. But Lord, we pray for that spirit of revival within ourselves. Lord, help us to live the life that you would have us live, that we can be an example to all those that desperately need you. Lord, please be with us in the service today. Please be with the special. Please be with Pastor as he preaches and prepare our hearts and our minds for today, Lord. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I know you're going through the fire It's getting hard to stand the heat But even harder is the wondering Is God's hand still on me? It's lonely in the flame when you're counting days of pain but the potter knows the clay and how much pressure it can take how many times around the wheel till their submission to his will he's planned a beauty design but it'll take some fire and time it's gonna be okay cause the potter knows the clay friend I just came through Not too very long ago And looking back I can see why And that my God was in control But on the hottest days I'd cry Oh Lord, isn't it about time but the potter knows the clay and how much pressure it can take how many times around the wheel till their submission to his will he's planned a beautiful design so much. 
I'm going to be in a bunch of different passages today, and I think it's better for me to read them to you than for you to turn. But if you'd like to try to turn, you're welcome to do that. But I want to show you something from an Old Testament picture that is relevant to you and to me right here, right now. And uh, if you will uh, give your attention and ask the Lord to help you to pay attention, and then uh, I believe that you'll get something today that will be of great, great help and great guidance to you from the Bible. So let's talk to the Lord. Father, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray if there's anyone today who is, is in here or watching by live stream that does not know Jesus Christ, I pray that they would put their faith in him today for salvation. Nevertheless, that is not the focus of the message. The focus of the message is to those who have believed on, believed on Jesus. Are we making progress or are we content to just stay where we have been since we got saved? And I pray that you would open our eyes. Spirit of God, empower me as I preach and open the hearts of each believer in the room as the word of God goes forth. I pray this would not just be a sermon. I pray it wouldn't just be a speech. But I pray that it would be a message from God, and only you can make it that. I pray that you would, please. In Christ's name, amen. The Old Testament of the Bible provides a multitude of pictures that illustrate the great doctrines of the New Testament. And one of the most detailed and instructive pictures is the picture provided for us in Israel's journey from Egypt to the promised land. Now, follow the picture, and the better you know the picture, the better, better this will make sense to you. But Egypt is a picture of the lost world. It's a picture of what you were before you were saved. Crossing the Red Sea is a picture of salvation. You pass through, and the water's closed, and you're saved, and there's no going back. The first 18 months of Israel's journey from Egypt to Kadesh Barnea, that first 18 months where they were moving forward, they were not wandering, they were moving forward, they were following the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, that's a picture of Christian growth. Kadesh Barnea, that's where they came to the place where God was ready for them to go into the promised land, but they were scared and they wouldn't go in. Kadesh Barnea, Barnea is a picture of refusing to surrender to God's will. And that resulted in another 38 and a half years of the children of Israel being in the wilderness. Only this time they weren't growing. This time they were wandering. And that wandering is a picture of carnal Christianity. Where you just sort of aimlessly wander through your faith. Crossing the Jordan, now this is a new generation of Israelites, and this happened 40 years after they came out of Egypt. Crossing the Jordan is a picture of surrendering to God's will. Now get this, because a lot of us picture the promised land, we think it's a picture of heaven, but it's not. And there are a lot of songs that talk about uh, Canaan land is just in sight, talking about heaven and uh, I don't think that's a, uh, a disservice to the word of God, but I do think it confuses what the promised land really does represent. The promised land represents the, whole, the, the, the victorious Christian life, the spirit-filled life. That's what the promised land is a picture of. I want you to consider this question, and this is... This question, the whole message this morning for the next few minutes is going to be based on this question. If the children of Israel had crossed the Red Sea and a couple of million of them, they just, they turned around when they got to the other shore. They saw the Egyptian army coming after them and they watched 
the waters of the Red Sea collapse on the Egyptian army. And they knew they were safe. They knew they were out of Egypt. They knew they were never going back. They knew the Egyptians could not pursue them any further because they just watched the Egyptians be destroyed. If they then and there said, you know what, we're so happy about this that we are just going to settle right here. We're going to build houses right here. We're going to build cities right here because we're safe here. And we're going to spend the rest of our lives rejoicing that we have crossed the Red Sea, that we're out of Egypt. God saved us, saved us from Egypt. We're safe now. If they had done that, would they have fulfilled God's will for Israel? Well, no, the answer is absolutely not. We know that just from reading the text that we read. Deuteronomy 6.23 says, this is Moses speaking, by the way, 40 years later. Mo and, and by the way, they're still not in the promised land at this point. They're on the doorstep once again. And Moses says, he brought us out from thence, meaning Egypt, that he might bring us in to give us the land which he swear unto our fathers. If the children of Israel had left Egypt, miraculously crossed the Red Sea, watched Pharaoh and his army be destroyed, and then said, okay, we're free. Let's build houses here. Let's build cities here they would not have been fulfilling God's purpose for them. The sad thing is, far too many Christians are content to camp out on the shores of the Red Sea for the rest of their lives. Far too many believers, it's not an American thing, strictly, it's not a 21st century thing, strictly. It's been true throughout the 20 centuries of the New Testament church. Far too many believers are content to camp out on the shores. In other words, getting saved is the extent of their spiritual pursuit. That's just enough God for me. That's about all of the, of the spiritual stuff that I can take is just to be born again. But I tell you, if you're content to camp out on those far shores of the Red Sea for the rest of your life after you've been delivered, you have not fulfilled God's purpose for your life. And here's the knucklehead question that we ask. But will I still make it to heaven? And I don't, know where, I don't know why we're so focused on just getting to heaven. When God says, no, I have an eternal purpose for you that I want you to fulfill. I've got something that, a place that I want to take you in this life. I have heights that I want you to press on to. Yeah, but, but why, if, I, if I don't, will I still get to heaven? And that is a tragically ignorant way to look at our spiritual lives and our spiritual growth. God didn't just save us from sin and hell. God saved us to take us to his prepared destinations in this life. Let me prove it to you from the New Testament. Romans 8, verses 29 and 30. For whom he did foreknow, that means God knew in advance. God knew before you were even created, before he had even created mankind, he knew that you were going to be a candidate for salvation. What he foreknow, foreknew, the Bible doesn't tell us. So if you have people that use this verse to, to say what God foreknew, they're not being truthful because the Bible doesn't tell us what he foreknew about us. My personal opinion is because in the next chapter he says that we were, uh, I'm sorry, in this very chapter, and then he expands on in the next chapter, about being conformable as clay in the hands of a potter. 
Maybe the thing that he knew about us is that we would be conformable to his will. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say all I can do is guess, all you can do is guess, all anybody else can do is guess. But he foreknew something about us. And based on what he foreknew about us, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of, of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. Now there's you getting saved, called and justified. But it doesn't stop there. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now, if God just intended for you to be saved, that would just say you were called and justified. Bang, period. But no, it also talks about being conformed to the image of his son. That's what he's doing in your life right now. Before you trusted Jesus, every day God was working to lead you to get saved. That's all. That's what he wanted for you, for you to get saved. But now that you're saved, every day God is working to get your attention to make you like Jesus Christ. That's his great pursuit in your life right now. God's working in your life. As I've said now probably about a dozen times this morning, he's taking you somewhere. He didn't intend for you just to turn to Christ, put your faith in him, and then Plop down and live the same life as everybody else until you die. No, he's taking you somewhere. Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Clearly, that's talking about getting saved. But it doesn't stop there. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And those are not general good works. Those are specific good works that God saved you to carry out. Titus 2, verses 11 through 14. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. All right, it's getting saved teaching us that denying God ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So he described getting saved, but then he described the lifestyle after we get saved. And then he goes back and sums it all up again. Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. Okay, there it is. Crossing through the Red Sea, bang, you're saved. And purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. That's what he has for you. That's where he's taking you after you get saved. He's trying to change me. He's trying to change you. He's trying to make us like Jesus Christ. One more example. Hebrews 13, verses 20 and 21. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. All right, so you've been saved. Make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. The examples in the New Testament are abundant. God didn't save you just so you could sit and wait to die. God didn't save you just so you can live the life that all the lost world is living. God saved you to take you on a brand new pursuit, a brand new spiritual journey. God didn't just take Israel out of Egypt. He was taking them to the promised land. And God didn't just save us from our sin. He saved, saved us to bring us to righteousness. To bring us to victory. To bring us to a real relationship with him. To bring us to making us like Jesus. He brought us out that he might bring us in. The message this morning is simply this. Don't be content. 
to build your life just on the other side of the Red Sea. Imagine the people of Israel if they'd gotten out. Now, look, it was a huge thing to come out of Egypt. It was a huge thing to not be in the bondage of slavery anymore. It was a huge thing for Pharaoh and his taskmasters to not be telling them every day when to get up, where to go to work, what they had to do, the quota they had to fill, when to go to bed. It was a huge thing to not have their lifestyles mandated by Pharaoh. Sure, that was huge. So they get out. They get to the shores of the Red Sea. They camp out there. They look behind, and they see the mightiest army on earth pursuing them. And here they are, unarmed. No organization to fight. Now what do we do? And some of them start to pray. Some of them start to complain. Moses turns to face the sea and he lifts up that rod of his, in his hand. And a strong wind came and blew those wall, those, uh, that water into walls. And the water parted. And they walked across the Red Sea on dry ground. And when, they got, when every last one of them got safely to the other side, they turned around. They saw the Egyptians pursuing them in that same pathway. And when they got into the middle of the ocean, all the, of the sea, all of a sudden their, their wheels started to fall off their chariots. Which means that the soldiers started, and the horses started to pile up. And those walls of water just instantly collapsed. And the greatest army on earth at that time was drowned. They're safe. They know they're safe. They know they're free. They know they're safe. And if they right then and there had said, you know what? It's not a bad place. Let's just make towns here. Let's build houses here. If they had done that, they'd come to the place where they'd have said, is, wait, is this really all there is? It wouldn't have made sense to them. If they had only been saved from Egypt to cross the Red Sea and then start a new nation there, it would not have made sense to them why they were in that place. And when you park just inside the door of salvation, the Christian life makes no sense. So all your bloggers, all your recovering Christians... Or your, your Facebookers and people on Twitter and Instagram that Christian life just doesn't make any sense to me. It's because they got saved and then they parked. Christian life isn't what it's cracked up to be. They got saved and then they parked. And it will never make sense to you when you park on the far shores of the Red Sea. It will never make sense to you when you walk into the door of salvation and then you stop there. There were Israelites who thrived and then there were those who didn't. By the way, the Bible says that there were Egyptians that left with Israel. I, maybe just because of the excitement of it. Maybe just because of the the. Thought of relocating? Oh, I'm so sick of this house. Let's just, let's just jump in this parade and go where they're going. The problem with that is the journey of the Israelites was a spiritual journey. It was a journey of people who were trusting the Lord. Not, not, as, not as great a proportion as it should have been. But it was a journey of people who were trusting the Lord. And when you've got it mingled with Egyptians who don't even believe the Lord going to cause some trouble and it caused a lot of trouble so there were israelites traveling in this two million people parade who thrived spiritually because they believed that god had a greater purpose they understood that god had promised the promised land to their forefather abraham it had been 400 years but they had heard from their parents and their parents before them and their parents before them that God promised to give this land.
to us, land they hadn't even seen yet, land where they didn't know anybody who had ever lived there. But there's this, this place, this promised land that God is taking us to. And they believe God had a greater purpose. He's, he's not just giving us new homes. He's building a nation like he promised Abraham he would. They lived in that faith. They lived in that hope. And you know what? They thrived on the journey. But then there were those who didn't. The believers who thrive are those who believe God has a greater purpose for them who believe he's doing something bigger than just what's right in front of them. And this really, I didn't plan it this way, but really goes hand in glove with the Sunday school lesson this morning. Joseph thrived through some of the greatest difficulties that a young adult man will ever face. He thrived. He kept his attitude right. Why? Because he believed God was taking him somewhere. He was betrayed by his brothers, but he didn't get bitter because he believed God was taking him somewhere. He was sold as a slave. He was taken from his homeland. Without, I mean, he didn't even get to pack. He didn't get any warning. His father sent him off one day and said, go find your brothers. Make sure that they're doing their jobs. And didn't know he wouldn't see his father again for 20 years when he left him. He's chained, chained, excuse me, chained to a cart being dragged to Egypt. Can't even understand a guy's talking that he's with. He could have got bitter, but he didn't because he believed God was taking him somewhere. He gets there, he's sold as a slave. Could have gotten bitter, but he didn't because he believed God was taking him somewhere. He's falsely accused of attempted rape. And without any trial, without any investigation, he's thrown in prison. Because he was falsely accused, Potiphar just saw some evidence and said it must be true. And threw him in prison. He could have gotten bitter. But he didn't because he believed God was taking him somewhere. And from there, even in prison, he was mistreated. But he didn't get bitter because he believed God was taking him somewhere. And that's the case with the Israelites who thrived. If they believed God was taking them somewhere that God had a greater purpose, they did fine. And the believers who thrive are those who believe that God has a greater purpose for them. And very quickly, we're almost done here. There were some things that the people of Israel had to learn. And I'm going to show you from the Old Testament that the people of Israel had to learn this. And from the New Testament, that believers have to learn these very same lessons. Four simple lessons. Number one, they had to learn to follow the Lord's lead. Listen to Exodus 13, 21. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. Now listen to Psalm 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Listen to Romans 8, 4. Walk not after the flesh, meaning following your flesh. That's the way the world lives, following the impulses of their flesh. Doing what they want to do, doing what they think is best. Walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You follow the path that the Holy Spirit leads you in. Are you spirit-led? Are you following the leadership of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God? 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. Again, the world around us walks by sight. We've got to learn what it means to walk by faith. We're not talking about being irresponsible. We're not talking about being neglectful or foolish. We're talking about seeing our responsibilities through the eyes of what God wants us to do. Walking by faith and walking by sight will have a lot of parallels. They often look very similar. But then sometimes walking by faith 
looks like such a departure, but actually it's walking by sight that is the departure. Walking by faith just stays straight in line with the principles of God's word. They had to learn to follow the Lord's lead. They also had to learn to obey God's instructions, and believers also have to learn to obey God's instructions. Why do you do that? Because the Bible says so. Exodus 18, 20, Thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws and shall show them the way wherein they must walk and the work that they must do. This is, that, that's the, the prelude to the giving of the Ten Commandments. They had to learn that. Before they were ready to go into the promised land, they had to learn that. And we, if we're going to live victoriously, if we're going to leave those shores of the Red Sea to go forward in pursuit in our salvation, we've got to learn to obey God's instructions. John 14, 15, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Follow the Lord. Obey the Lord. They also had to learn to trust God's provision. Exodus 16, verse 4. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may uh, prove them whether they will walk worthy in my law or not. The manna, six days a week, was more than just provision. It was God testing whether the people would trust his provision. Jesus instructed us, and this isn't even my New Testament verse. It just popped in my head here. Jesus instructed us to pray what? Give us this day our daily bread. Do you only pray that when you don't have any food? Or are you to pray that when you say, no, we got everything we need? If you're trusting the Lord's provision, you pray that always. Which is why, by the way, on our church prayer list, one of the staples of our church prayer list is, Lord, please meet your church's lack. Well, man, what if we're making, meeting the budget every week and have abundance and we're doing all these projects? We don't have to pray that anymore. No, we're supposed to pray, give us this day our daily bread, whether we think we're set or whether we think we're in trouble. We've got to learn to trust the Lord's provision. Here's the New Testament verse, Matthew 6, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Worry about pleasing God more than you worry about whether your cupboards are stocked, whether your pantry is stocked. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things, the basics of life, will be added unto you. God will provide. God will provide. I saw somebody on on Twitter the other day uh, ask the question. She said, um, everybody's warning about a food shortage. And I think we should hear the warning shot. If you don't have babies and you don't care about baby formula right now, it may not be a big deal to you. But if if there can be a shortage of baby formula, there can be a shortage of any kind of food product. And I think we need to be aware that there could be a major food shortage coming this very year. And some are saying it's happening already. And somebody asked a question on Twitter the other day, a high-profile person. What's the most important thing to stock up on if you don't have a garden, if you don't even have the land where you can make a vegetable garden? But you just need to stock up on. And I loved the answer. Because the answer is my favorite thing. If I could only have one thing, it would be peanut butter. And I know you say, but you need something to put it on. Yeah, a spoon works for me. If you don't have a spoon, a butter knife. And if I don't have a butter knife, this will gross you out. I don't do it, but I would if I had to. The end of a ballpoint pen. I don't care. Whatever I can dip in there and scoop it out. I just absolutely, I've always loved peanut butter. And somebody who, a doctor answered and said, if you, if you have to stock up on one thing, peanut butter. Okay, great. But you know what the real answer is? What's the most important thing to stock up on? And I'm not against stocking up. And, and I'm, I, don't, I don't have, uh, you know, right now, literally, I've got enough that my wife and I could eat for about a month. That's not much. But 
we're, we're, I'm, I'm, I'm adding to it all the time. It, the problem is adding to it without taking from it. The pro stocking up on peanut butter and then never eating the peanut butter. That's, that's the hard part for me. But I'm not against stocking up, and I think you ought to. I think you ought to be doing that. But the most important thing to stock up on, learning to trust the Lord for your needs. Amen. Learning that he will not fail you. And even when you look back and you say, oh, I'm afraid I've been a little irresponsible. I'm afraid I've been a little neglectful. Knowing that, okay, if you had been more responsible, it would be going better for you, no doubt. But the most important thing is to trust the Lord. He will not fail you. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. You've got to learn to follow the Lord's lead, obey God's instruction, trust God's provision, and lastly, to submit to God's purpose. Now, I've got a big, long passage here. I'm not going to read it because you know the story. Submit to God's purpose in Numbers chapter 13 and 14. Moses sent 10 spies into the land, not to see if they could go in, but to map out a game plan. But they thought their job was to come back and say why they couldn't go in. Ten of them did. Ten of them came back and said, oh, it never worked. There's giants in there, and they got chariots, and they got armies. And, they got... and two of them said, what are you talking about? <laughs> they said, if God is on our side, we can't lose. But the people, the multitudes, they didn't listen to Joshua and Caleb, who said, just follow the Lord. They listened to the ten spies who said, oh, it's hopeless. Let's just, you know what, let's go back to Egypt. Let's just make an army and go back to Egypt, and let's not listen to Moses anymore. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Let's go back to Egypt. That's all found in Numbers 14, 1 through 8. What happened there? They lost sight of God's purpose. Do you understand that if God has a purpose and you are surrendered to it, you can't lose? God's purpose is going to be fulfilled. And if you're surrendered to it, it you're, it's a no-lose situation for you. We've got to learn to submit to God's purpose in our lives. Listen to Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good. And, and that's been quoted so many times by people, even lost people, to say, see, everything's going to turn out okay. All things work together for good. That's not for lost people, and it's not for most Christians. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Are you surrendered to God's purpose? If you can honestly say, yes, I love God and I am surrendered to his purpose, then yes, that promise is for you. Everything in your life is going to contribute to the fulfillment of God's purpose in your life. But if you're not, if you're not in love with the Lord, and you're not focused, surrendered to his purpose, that promise is not for you. Your life is only a little less random than the life of the lost person. So, are you saved today? If you're not saved, I beg you to make Jesus Christ your Savior by faith. But the message really has not been specifically for you. It's been to those who are saved. And to those who are saved, which is most of us in the room, maybe all of us, are you camped out just inside the gate of salvation? Do you hunger for God's purpose in your life as much as you hungered to be saved before you were saved? You knelt at a church altar somewhere. You knelt in your living room with, with a soul winner with their Bible open. Or, or you, you watched an a evangelistic crusade on TV and God got a hold of your heart. And you wept and you cried and said, oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And you wanted so badly to know that you were born again. Do you have that same appetite for God to take you where he wants to take you in your life? To learn to follow his lead, to learn to obey his instructions, to learn to trust his provision, to learn to submit to God's purpose. Do you have that hunger in your heart? I'm just going to close 
by saying what I said in, in our adult Bible class. By saying, and I don't know why God's put this on my heart. I haven't had any special epiphany. It's just heavy on my heart today, and I feel like I need to say this. I'm not going to be living here all the time, but I just feel like God wants me to remind us that it doesn't take a lot of perception to see that we are in a spiral, not only in our society, in the whole world, heading towards a great darkness and calamity. And the only way we're going to be spared from that is by the mercy of God, by an act of God. We are going to have to learn to survive under horrible circumstances, I fear. Now, that means we're going to have to learn to follow the Lord, to obey the Lord. To learn to trust him to provide. And to be consumed with his purpose. Here's the question that has been on my heart for a couple of days. Lord, if we do get to that spot, if our country really gets lower than we ever thought it could get. I saw a picture of Seattle the other day. I couldn't believe it. Couldn't even believe that was in America. Let alone in one of our elite cities. Well, that's the West Coast. It can't get here. We're too cold a climate. I'm glad you're confident. I'm not. If we get to that place, here's my question for, for the Lord, me to the Lord. What role do you want our church to play? What's our job? Now, I know our, 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 our general role is the same as for every church. Get people saved and teach them to grow in the Lord. But if you have a specific role for us to play, for, again, I'm, I'm saying this, re repeating it. I won't go too deep into this. I'm almost done. But we've had specific roles over the last 25 years. The Lord has used us to do specific things in addition to those general things that we're supposed to always be doing. And I'm always, I want to always be open for what the Lord has for us, whatever it is. Whatever it is, what is our role, Lord? Would you ask the Lord that for yourself? What is my role? What is our church's role? What is the role that you have for us to play in whatever lies ahead for our country, for our city, for our country, for our world? What is our job? What is our role? What do you have for us to do? Because I want to fulfill it. I want to fulfill it. Father, I pray that you would... Help me to never be content to camp out on the eastern shores of the Red Sea. Oh, God, I pray that I... And, and please don't ever let me be those ten spies. I beg you, God. Don't ever let me be the ten spies who say, God can't do it. It's too hard. Let's go back. I beg you, Lord. I could get there. Many a preacher has gotten there. I don't want to get there. But help us, help me and help us to be of the spirit that says, I want to learn to follow God's leadership. I want to learn to obey God's instructions. I want to learn to trust God's provision. And I want to learn to stay surrendered to God's purpose. Oh, God, give us such a heart. Give us such a heart, I pray. I pray. Would you stand with me this morning, and, and would you just write where you are? I'm not going to give an altar call this morning. I want to invite you to do business with the Lord right where you are. And if you heard the message, and you say, yeah, I want that to be my heart. See, there were two hearts among the Israelites the heart that said, what are we doing here? This isn't, oh, this, oh, this doesn't make sense. I can't figure this out. I, oh, I hate it here. I wish I was back in Egypt. There was that heart, that opinion. And then there was the heart that said, I want what God has for us. I want what God has for us. And if that's your heart, if your heart is, I want what God has for me, then would you ask the Lord right there, could I lead you in a simple prayer? And if it matches what's in your heart, a bit just based on the message, if it matches what's in your heart, would you ask the Lord 
just you and God, Lord, would you do this? Would you ask the Lord, dear God, please teach me to obey your instructions? Teach me how to follow your lead. Please teach me, Lord, to trust your provision. Teach me, Lord, to surrender to your purpose. Lord, prepare me, please, for the job that you have me to do in the days that lie ahead. Help me to be prepared for whatever happens in our, in our world, in our country, in our city. Would you take a moment to continue in prayer before the Lord? Just standing right there where you are as the piano plays. Ask the Lord to work. Lord, I don't know why you put this so heavily on my heart this morning. I really don't. But I believe you, you did it for a purpose. <clears throat> and then to see how you just knit the, the uh, story of Joseph in with it today. Again, not really my intention, but it just came together. Lord, I would much rather overstate the dangers that lie ahead than to allow us to be spiritually unprepared. Oh, God, I would not want to be guilty of that in the lives of these dear people. Many of them I know, already know, and already working to those ends. But, Lord, I, I believe at this hour, we cannot afford to be less passionate about you. We've got to be more passionate than ever before in our prayers in our obedience, in our direction. Help us to be so, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated. Somebody you getting ready? Okay. All right. Um, we're going to baptize this morning. Very excited about this. And uh, so, uh, I'm, and I'm going to go back. This, this may be my last time to baptize for a while. And I'll explain more about that maybe tonight. But I'm excited to be able to baptize. And so, uh, I'm going to go get ready to baptize. And... Um, Joe, these are the announcements. I forgot that I was not going to be reading them. So uh, could you stick in the men's prayer meeting? That's what that means. Just read those announcements and then uh, get some singing going, and then you'll come meet me in the back. All right, Brother Freddie, who's probably going to call upon you to help him with that. Thank you very much. All right, do we have uh, what's, do we have He Will Hold Me Fast? Can we do that one? All right, cool. All right, let's sing one verse of He Will Hold Me Fast. Sing with me, ready? For my life he bled and died, Christ will hold me fast. Justice has been satisfied, he will hold me fast. Raised with him to endless light, he will hold me fast. Till our faith is turned to side When he comes at last Sing a church He will hold me fast He will hold me fast For my Savior loves me so He will hold me fast Let's sing the chorus again he will hold me fast, he will hold me fast, for my Savior loves me so, he will hold me fast.
last one more time a cappella. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. Great singing. Brother Freddie, I'm going to make two of these announcements, and then you can make the rest. Um, June 5th, we announced it last week, and I'm just going to give some more details about it. June 5th will be Family Sunday, and uh, we're going to have uh, a choir special. All of the kids from downstairs and the teenagers, we're all going to sing up here. So it, it's going to be a great special and uh, a great opportunity for you to bring your family and for you to see your kids sing in the choir. We're going to have some blow-ups and some games and some cotton candy, and it's just going to be an all-day thing. So family, family day is usually like a church fair. So uh, bring your family, bring your friends, and uh, it's going to be a great day. Is this mic sounding weird, or is it this one? Maybe it's just my voice. I don't know. It's all the voices in my head. Uh, anyway, uh, so make sure you bring your family for June 5th. And uh, also tonight uh, after church, we're going to rearrange some things in the basement of the teen house. We're going to fix the, uh, the, uh, uh, the water system up there. So if we could just get some, especially teenage guys, but some men to help us with that, we'll, uh, we'll take just, just at the most 10 minutes. And uh, don't worry, guys, it won't cut into the volleyball time. But uh, we'll just rearrange some things, make some space so that the guys coming to fix the system could uh, have plenty of room and we'll get it done very quickly. Uh, looks like that's it for me. Brother Freddie, if you can make the rest of these, that'd be great. Thank you. All right, once continuing with the announcements, this Wednesday night we will have Wednesday night soul winning at 6.15. We will continue in the Foundations of My Faith Discipleship Series during prayer meeting. And this Wednesday, we'll be discussing the basics of the Word of God. Uh, that's the little booklets that we've had. And uh, it's something great to, for no matter what level you are in terms of your Christianity, whether you're a brand new Christian or you've been a Christian for forever, uh, it's a great thing to definitely be a part of. On Saturday from 7 to 7.30, 7 we have the men's prayer meeting. So if you have some time around at 7 o'clock, swing by here. It's a great time of prayer for our country, for our church, for so many different things. A great spirit of prayer is in that place. And join us Saturday, May 28th for our spring Danbury Blitz. And we're taking the gospel to hundreds of doors in one day. That's going to be an awesome thing. I'm sure we'll have a sign-up sheet somewhere. If you have any questions about that, please talk to Brother Jose. And it looks like we're going to be baptizing today. So um, we have a song. Turn to your hymnals to song number 309. singing our great Savior. Jesus, what a friend for sinners. Jesus, lover of my soul. Friends may fail me, foes assail me. He, my Savior, makes me whole. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Hallelujah, what a friend. Saving, helping, keeping, loving. He is with me to the end. On verse 2 now. Jesus, what a strength in weakness. Let me hide myself in him. Tempted, tried, and saw. Times failing, he my saint, my victory wins. Hallelujah, what a savior! Hallelujah, what a friend, saving, helping, keeping. 
be loving. He is with me to the end. Amen. All right. Very good. This is Stephen Vasquez, and you probably can't see him, but trust me, he's here. All right. And uh, he is coming for baptism. He asked if he could be baptized. And so let me ask you, Stephen, do you believe that Jesus died for your sins? Have you made the Lord Jesus Christ as you take him? Thank you, Lord, not only for the privilege of putting our faith in Jesus Christ, but the joy of demonstrating it openly by following you and believing in baptism. Thank you for Stephen. Thank you for his faith. I pray that you bless him mightily, Lord, in his walk with you. Lead him. Encourage him. Work in his life, I pray. Bless as we go. Give us a great day for your glory. Keep us close to you. Thank you for loving us, Lord. We love you. Christ, we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day. Thank you.